I'm so grateful to see all these wonderful faces, see many of my heroes and heroines, <laughs> people I've known about for a long time and perhaps haven't known personally, and some of you I have. So where do we start our journeys? And usually they start with our personal experiences, our academic interests, our research, usually are initiated by trying to solve problems in our own lives. Why do we meditate? Why do we seek transcendent states? Why do we look for solutions like this? It's because we're suffering, as many people are. I wrote a book called Bliss Brain, and in that I looked at the percentage of the population with some interest in extricating themselves from those dilemmas over time. And it's interesting to look at CDC numbers for meditators, and see those numbers increasing over the last 30 or 40 years. Also look at, at data from, from societies like in the Middle Ages. We see, for example, in the Domesday Book in England, we see data from China and India around 1300. We see data from France and Germany, and it shows that a small number of people were interested in, in doing serious work to try and, and just improve their lives, improve their, their states. And that's how I got into it as well. I was a miserable teenager, as I suspect many of us here were. And I just remember wanting to jump off the bridge most, most weeks. I just felt so depressed and miserable and anxious and didn't know what to do with myself. So at the age of 15, I ran away from home and joined a spiritual community. And we got deep into Alan Watts and we were doing the perennial philosophy and reading Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson and all these inspirational figures. We were very influenced by Ram Das and, and all of the, the whole movement of the new age then, the age of Aquarius, supposedly dawn, dawning back then. And so that was what I got into this to try and fix was my own personal suffering. And I suspect many of us have done the same thing. So I also spent a lot of time on research, about 20 years research, researching PTSD. And I was particularly focused on emotional freedom techniques or EFT because I began hearing reports from colleagues around 2004 when the first group of veterans was coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan that they were having great results from using EFT to treat PTSD. EFT is very simply a combination of a cognitive therapy, uh, elements of behavior therapy, um, elements of exposure therapy, allied with acupressure. So people use acupressure and EFT in the form of tapping on acupuncture points. And it has long tradition, Qigong's been using acu acupressure for a long time, Shiatsu massage uses acupressure. And what the reports were initially, anecdotal reports were showing was that veterans were rapidly recovering from flashbacks and nightmares and intrusive thoughts using these techniques. So with a group of colleagues, I began to do research, initially small pilot studies, later on large-scale randomized controlled trials, eventually physiological studies. And we found that, for example, cortisol dropped dramatically after using EFT. We found that PTSD symptoms dropped by over 60% using EFT. And so that resulted in uh, eventually a, a large body of research. And I'm going to share my screen over here and show you the EFT research page. This is at the URL um, research.eftuniverse.com. And I'm going to share my screen here and show you that that page. And from when, when we began in 2002 to today, we have over 100 studies. We have quite a number of meta-analyses. I think there were eight at last count, many of them independent, done by independent research teams, not by uh, people allied with EFT. These are the just the anxiety studies over here on this panel over here. So as you see, a lot of research on anxiety showing that people recover from anxiety very, very quickly 
when they use EFT. This is depression over here. And again, a lot of studies of depression, pain and physical symptoms, especially autoimmune diseases, fibromyalgia, psoriasis, people tend to improve when their energy systems shift. And we can measure this using instruments like MRIs and EEGs. So that led eventually not just to the theoretical research that showed that PTSD and all of that suffering could be ameliorated. It also led to a social project because just doing ivory tower research doesn't have an impact on real world global problems of suffering. I, I, I peer reviewed studies before and I published a lot of research in various journals. I tend to first try and get published in mainstream journals. After I've had about five rejections, <laughs> I then might publish in a, a non-mainstream journal, but I tend to go, go publish in American Psychological Association journals, in mainstream journals, because I want to have an impact on, on the world. I want to have an impact on, on real, real human problems. So we approached the Veterans Administration with our early data, and we got nowhere. We literally had members of Congress writing to the head of the Veterans Administration and not getting a hearing. I testified before congressional committees twice on PTSD. And again, the VA just was doing nothing about getting these therapies to veterans. So we started a, a private organization now called the Veterans Stress Solution. Again, applying the findings of using energy therapies with veterans to treatment for veterans, free treatment for veterans. And that led to the Veterans Stress Solution, which again, I'm gonna share with you on another screen over here. And in 2008, we began to offer free treatment to veterans using EFT, using heart math, using other evidence-based practices. And we've now been able to share these practices and give free treatment over 21,000 veterans, as you see on the page of the Veterans Stress Solution. People can, can talk to us, people can work with a therapist, and they can get help really quickly when they're most in crisis. And so eventually, 10 years later, <laughs> the VA came around and approved EFT as an evidence-based treatment. But it took 10 years of persistence, and it took lots of data. And I just want to uh, say that that's what this group is all about and why our work is so important because reading the um, the stories of people who are having transcendent experiences is powerful and moving. But when you're going to a place like the VA, like Kaiser Permanente, like Humana Healthcare, you need data. And so what is so encouraging here is we're, we're gathering that, we're measuring these states, we're quantifying the change that people, people experience. And it's not just saying, I'm doing better, I'm feeling better, I'm experiencing these states. It's describing how much better I'm feeling. So once I spent roughly 20 years on that endeavor of getting these treatments to veterans, I then said, what's next? What I wanted want to do, what's the next highest priority? And the next highest priority was going right back to me as a teenager, running away and joining a spiritual community. And it was meditation. But I I had a difficult time meditating when I was a teenager. I'd sit and close my eyes. And many traumatized people find this. They close their eyes and they try and meditate, and they're just flooded by intrusive thoughts. And so the default mode network cranks up, they begin to remember all the all the insults of the past, all of the threats that might happen in the future, they're not in the present moment, and they can't meditate effectively. So I began to play around with combining techniques. What EFT had taught me was that body-based techniques are really important. Uh, Mentally-based techniques are hard. You have to try and use your, your cognitive abilities to control your fight or flight response and it's not usually that successful. But if you use a body-based technique with EFT, it's tapping. With heart math, you can use breathing. Breathing techniques are really useful. And so I wondered one day, I was at a conference and talking to a whole bunch of different people with different techniques, mindfulness and heart coherence and self-hypnosis, 
and others, neurofeedback, I thought, you know, these techniques are all so good. They all have evidence bases. What would happen? <laughs> what would happen if we simply stacked them all one up on top of the other? What if I did EFT tapping first for a minute? Then I did the heart co quick coherence technique from heart math. Then I did a uh, mindful breathing technique. Then I did, uh, did and I, I, so I did it. I began to practice myself. And suddenly, <laughs> after a lifetime of failure, I could meditate, but I wasn't using my mind. I wasn't believing in anything. I wasn't following any spiritual practice. I was telling my body to enter this relaxed but alert state. And I posted ecomeditation.com on the web. I, I, I called it eco meditation, ECO meditation, put it up on the web. And a few years later, my webmaster said to me, Dawson, we're getting thousands of people just visiting this page. It's a, a crummy looking page. It, 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 we haven't promoted the page at all. And we're having thousands of people come to the page and we're having thousands of people tell us, hundreds of people tell us that it's really working for them. So we then began to do some research into quantifying what eco meditation achieves. And I'm gonna again show you a couple of uh, studies here. So very briefly, Eco meditation stacks these five techniques on top of each other. Heart coherence, neurofeedback, EFT, mindfulness, and vagal nerve regulation. And we found that when people did this, even those that had failed every other meditation practice they tried, most of them were able to reach those states. So we then began to collect data and publish our results. And now there, there are quite a few studies of eco meditation. Some of them are physiological ones. And I really like physiological studies because self-report is interesting, but it's self-report. It's not objective biological data. When you gather data on heart rate variability and uh, EEG brainwave changes, and heart coherence, and cortisol, and salivary immunoglobulin A, those are independent of self-report. And so those are independent biomarkers of change, which is why when I can afford them, <laughs> when I raise enough money from the bake sale to be able to afford a bunch of cortisol tests, I'll usually do that in preference. And so we looked in the study at what happens to the brain. Now, this was a large-scale study. This was a this was a randomized controlled trial. We randomized 38 participants into two groups. One did mindful breathing, the other one did eco meditation, and they did this in the form of a pre-recorded audio track. And then we had them back into the into the MRI lab in a month, and got a second reading. And here's what we found. We found that in only those 28 days of 22 minutes a day practicing this, we found functional connectivity changes in the brain. And when, again, when these scans were taken, these people were not meditating. This means that these were baseline changes in their ordinary state in the brain in just 28 days. And when I showed these to some, some of my colleagues, you know, one, one said, oh, well, I can, he didn't know where the, where the brain scans had come from. And it showed him the composite MRIs. He said, well, it's, it's clear. These are Tibetan monks with 10,000 plus hours because look, look at this red patch over here, the default mode network, the front part of it has quietened down. The mid prefrontal cortex has gone dark. It had a big drop in activity. And what has lit up here is the insula. And the insula was was on these MRI scans brightly lit up in these people while the default mode network, the front part of it, the mid prefrontal cortex had 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 dialed activity way back. And again, this is not during meditation. This is their normal resting state after 28 days. Also, these were not meditators. These were non-meditators who had just begun practicing very, very, very recently. So here we found it was changing the brain and it was changing it in only a month of practice. This study looked again at 
various physiological markers, salivary immunoglobulin A, heart rate variability, blood pressure, resting heart rate, and so on. And it was a small sample. It wasn't a very large number of people, only 17 people, but it did show significant results in several dimensions. Uh, there were significant drops in cortisol in two days. This is two days, this is at a retreat. And so these people are practicing meditation. They're tapping, which again, releases traumatic stress symptoms, and then they're meditating. And we're seeing these, these, these changes in their physiology, including a big drop in cortisol between day one and day three. So again, this is not independent self-report. This is physiology. And the self-report changes are also good. Anxiety, depression, and PTSD went down. Uh, but because of the uh, small sample size, PTSD was not significant. Uh, pain went down and happiness increased, another typical finding of these studies. So these are some of the results of eco-meditation. Eco-meditation is still a free download at ecomeditation.com. And these are just some of the things we found in various studies, anxiety down 23%, pain down 43%. All of these are significant, uh, gamma increasing. And one of the researchers that studied people doing eco-meditation for the first time wrote uh, that eco-meditation produced extraordinarily high levels of gamma synchrony between the left and right hemispheres. Participants acquired elevated brain states normally found only after years of meditation practice. Eco-meditation facilitated participants' ability to induce and sustain the alpha brain waves characteristic of high-level emotional, mental, and spiritual integration. And again, these are people doing eco-meditation for a weekend for the first time. So what I, again, am, am finding here with meditation is it's the body. The body keeps the score. And as we shift the body, it becomes easy to do. One lady at that workshop said, Dawson, I've been so inspired by my, my experiences doing eco meditation. And I made a, a pact with myself. I would do it every single day for 30 days. And I was so happy to hear that because she had a first initial experience that was great. She then said, I'm going to commit to doing this for 30 days. I, I asked her, well, you know, which, which day are you on right now? She said, I'm on day 147. <laughs> and that's because you feel really good doing this. Some research shows that, that people have a 65% rise in the brain in dopamine that it often will trigger the release of serotonin. And so in my book, This Brain, I wanted to explain all of these wonderful brain drugs, serotonin, oxytocin, anandamide, nitric oxide, and the effect that they have, and the research into what they what happens in the brains of meditators. And it struck me looking at pictures of some of these monks and nuns that they look stoned. And that's because they are. They're just having this, these fabulous floods of these pleasure-inducing neurochemicals like anandamide, oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine. So you reach these transcendent states, and it's biology as well as psychology and phenomenology and spirituality. And the body is showing us how effective it is to use body-based body -based methods. I'm going to share, share, share a couple more screen images, and then we'll have time for questions. This is a recently published study in, in Frontiers in Psychology. And again, I usually aim high. Frontiers is currently the number one psychology journal in the world. And this is looking at flow states. I'm looking not just at psychology, psychological conditions, I'm looking at flow states here. We found a significant increase in flow states. And another thing we have begun to look at besides flow, because you want to correlate these these brain states with the with the with the experience of flow. So we're measuring flow states now. And um we're we're finding that there are large increases in flow. If you're a, a researcher, 
please start to measure and report percent change and report Cohen's D because Cohen's D is clinical significance. Like I peer reviewed studies with high statistical significance for something like PTSD. I look at the clinical significance and it's, it's not there. I wanna know, does this help suffering people? That's what counts, not getting statistical significance with no clinical significance. So report percent change, how much, what percentage did people change and report Cohen's D clinical significance. And here I do that in the study. So we found uh, an effects effect for on flow states and on transcended experiences. Now I'm going to close by sharing a little bit about transcendent experiences. So Jeffrey and other others who are um, reporting in the space are are doing a wonderful job with data collection. But unlike Jeffrey, I'm interested in a really brief measure that people taking a workshop of mine can fill out. <clears throat> so if they're taking a two-hour workshop, I don't have time to collect an hour of pre and an hour of post data. I need something that's going to be a uh, shown effect that they can fill out in two minutes. Veterans will not sit still and fill out reams of data. Um, I needed something really quick. So I developed something called the Transcendent Experiences Scale. <clears throat> it's based on Andrew Newberg's book, How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain. And so we use that for this study published in Frontiers in Psychology, as well as other metrics as well. And let me just skip ahead here for a moment. Um, so these, it's a five item scale, scored zero through 10. And these five items come from Andrew Newberg's book, How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain. As he gathered stories from thousands of people about their transcendent experiences, these were the five commonalities he found. And so we've now been, I said, Andrew, what, I emailed him one day and said, Andrew, let's turn these into a scale. So we have now, we've tested validity and reliability. We find it has pre-post reliability. It's valid and it correlates with the mystical experiences questionnaire and also the non-dual embodiment thematic inventory, the NETI. So it, it has convergent validity with those two scales, but only five items. Now it's free, you can use it if you want to. It's, it's not, not proprietary, we're not, we aren't gonna copyright it. It's just something we wanna make available to people who want a very, very brief instrument they can use with populations who won't fill out uh, long questionnaires. And the other thing we began to look at is, <clears throat> I become very, very curious about what impact this has on daily life. Now, I love going out there. Every morning I wake up in the morning, I meditate, and I just love entering those states. I spend roughly an hour, maybe two hours some days. If I have a weekend, if I have a retreat, I'll spend many hours there. And I know when I come back, I have to ground myself. I have to really work. It really works. It's, it's hard to come back here. And after you meditated for an hour, coming back and say doing a team meeting or working on a, on a problem in your, your business, because I have a, an active business, that's my source of income. I'm not an academic. I, I, I don't have any, any income other than my, my, my business and my work. And coming back and dealing with you know, hackers and dealing with um, interpersonal problems and all those things isn't very enticing after you've been drifting in the great silence, the void, what, what Paul Brunton calls the great silence for an hour or two. So um, I really wondered though, are people better when they're in those week, those team meetings? Are they better when they're at work? Are they better parents? Are they more effective at what they do? So I began to study productivity. Are they more productive when they get back from those elevated states? And I also have been looking at this whole field of relational spirituality not having a dusty, dry, theoretical, mental relationship with something larger than yourself, but the passion of Rumi, the passion of St. Teresa. I mean, you read these mystics and they aren't just happy about being up there. They are passionate. You look In my book, Bliss Brain, I compare the neurochemicals of deep meditation with the neurochemicals of orgasm. 
and Rumi and St. Catherine and St. Clair and St. Teresa, they're having orgasmic experiences. These modern day mystics aren't just happy. They are orgasmically happy. That's why the Shakers shake and the Quakers quake. They were having orgasmically amazing experiences when they were doing this. So we measure this now, we measure that. And then we measure when you come back down to earth, you ground yourself. What's going on when you are working with other people? So we begin to now study personal productivity and also personal productivity after what's called relational spirituality, that passionate relationship with something larger than yourself. And it turns out that people are getting lot, a lot more productive. So my last share over here is a study that is not published yet, but is in peer review with, a, again, a mainstream journal. And we found these, these are the clinical significance scores. So the, the statistical significance is reported earlier, but you need to measure things and report percent change and, and Cohen's D, clinical significance. And their productivity. Now, these are people who are out there, who are having these transcendent experiences. They're, they're passionately in love with the all it is. They're taking a course I wrote called a 21-day walk with your higher power. And they're falling passionately in love with their higher power, relational spirituality, not theoretical spirituality. And we find that their productivity increased an astonishing 20%, 19.96%, after 21 days with their higher power. And when we measured them again, six months later, it was even higher, it was 26%. So now they're more effective mothers and fathers and team members and community members. And so all of those experiences now are affecting their outer lives. And that's that's really what we need to do. We are we know our earth is in crisis. We know our society is in crisis. We need to be effective down here at the level of local mind, of everyday reality, and bring our transcendence down and be effective at this local level. So uh, again, it's been a real pleasure to share this with you. And I look forward to the, the, the next phase of research, what we'll share next and discover next. I know there's a huge shift in society with the numbers of people meditating, 1% of people in developed countries meditated in 1980. According to CDC figures, it had risen to 4%, quadruple by 2005. Today, it's hitting 20%. So we see this exponential curve of people wanting to be in these spaces. And here we are to show them the benefits of them. So thanks again for being here. Thanks for this wonderful conference. Jeffrey, thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Dawson. It's awesome to see you, as always. We have uh, maybe one minute for a quick question before the person Dawson was mentioning actually is up next. Uh, Andrew Newberg is on next. Does um, anyone uh, have a quick question for Dawson? I have a quick question. If it, I have a question. Really Go ahead. Me, um, or any of the studies that you have reviewed uh, specific for the pandemic period, for the COVID period, especially countrywide? That's a very good question. I appreciate that. And yes, some of these are pre-COVID, others are COVID. And we found actually, we, we have one coming out that compares people post-COVID doing this virtually on Zoom versus people doing it pre-COVID in a room meditating together. And the results actually were better for the virtual study. So uh, yeah. We, we are actually comparing that. That's not published yet, but it will be coming out soon.